Well, hello and uh, welcome to another in the series of Cafe Insights. I'm Andrew Vine, CEO of the Insight Bureau, and today it's my pleasure to be in conversation with Adit Jain from India. Thank you, Andrew. Okay, well, Adit is a, a well-known advisor to corporates in, in India. He's the chairman uh, and formerly ran the, the IMA India business. He's uh, called upon to advise on India, so I thought no better person just to grab uh, while you're in Singapore. And so tell us, what's, uh, what brought you to Singapore? I had a client briefing mm-hmm. uh, a couple of days ago, which went well and which clearly demonstrate, demonstrates there's still a lot of interest in India. I think a lot of attention has been focused on China, though, rather than India. Yes, that is true, and uh, I don't think there is any comparison. Yeah. Uh, it's not a matter of choice. Uh, China is really the second largest economy in the world. So yeah. It's a matter of time, a few years, when it will become the largest. But uh, over the next 10 years, I honestly believe India's economy will double from its current size and therefore the impact it will have on global supply chains and global demand will in many ways be similar to what China did uh, to the rest of the world over the course of the last 10 years. Mm. I think it's typical to say that the time frame that you expect things to develop with the Indian economy is going to be slower. That that China's had such a rapid pace and that it can't easily be replicated by other countries. Well, that is true. India will never grow at 10 to 11 percent on a sustained basis, yeah. although it can. It, its economic structures allow it to happen because it has a large savings rate uh, and therefore it is technically, if you like, capable of growing at 9 percent a year on a sustained basis. But there are other impediments in the shorter term which will prevent such growth. But be that as it may, I believe that in the longer term, the economy will grow at 7.5 to 8% okay. on a sustained basis. You know, Andrew, I thought I might take the opportunity of this chat uh, to provide a few comments on what the government has actually done. Because there's been a lot of discussion on expectations not having been met and the economy isn't thumping ahead with uh, 8 to 9% growth. But there have been certain tangible achievements which people don't often talk about and I believe that companies should be aware of because in the longer term, they have an impact on the market. I was going to ask you because I think that when Prime Minister Modi took office, he came with very high expectations that things would change quite dramatically. And so I was interested to hear, you know, what you felt the verdict really is. Well, I think the jury is still out on a number of issues. But as an analyst, I believe that the judgment will fall uh, on the side of the government's favour because of the following. The first is, over the course of the last two years, they've undertaken serious reforms in the financial sector. Right. Basically with schemes like Jandhan, GST, etc. Where physical savings, people, households that saved in land, and property and gold, are moving their money into financial instruments. And that's a wonderful thing because it has long-term consequences. You'd be surprised to hear that in the course of the last two years, 250 million new bank accounts have been opened. And therefore, 100% of India is now banked. They have bank accounts. Mm. And that makes a big difference because they are now in the inclusive economy and therefore with longer-term repercussions. The second issue is that with the movement of money into financial savings, the size of assets under management in India has increased from 2 trillion rupees two years ago to 6 trillion now. And they're adding 200 billion rupees a month. So all this is wonderful because these are real savings in financial instruments which help new investment, so on and so forth. The second issue where good reforms have happened is in the area of tackling subsidy and direct benefit transfers. So there was a hell of a lot of leakage that used to happen. And now with benefits being transferred in directly into these hundreds of millions of bank accounts, yeah. people who had entitlements, <coughs> that money isn't lost. And the savings apparently are conservatively calculated at about 2% of GDP. The third is the resolution of the banks. Everybody knew that India's banks were in big trouble. But now they have been recapitalized to the tune of 2.5 trillion rupees. And therefore they will start lending again. Yeah. So what does that actually mean? What this means is that in the course of the next two or three years, you will find new investment begin to happen. 
new investment was lacking. The economy was growing at 6.5%, largely based on consumption, but that will change. So if you were to call me in for a chat like this two years from now, I would happily report that the economy is growing both as a result of investment and as a result of consumption. So these are some of the broad areas where mm. I believe uh, will have longer term implications. Very quickly and finally, it's about federalism. I think what the government has done is moved a greater share of government expenditure uh, from the federal level to the states. Nice. So money is more local right. and they can focus on local projects. Yeah. Well, I was interested to ask, as India develops, where these pockets or where these industries are and what, which are the sectors that you see playing a more significant role? I'm looking right now, Andrew, at a map of India which has been plotted based on urbanization and based on investment. And the map reveals to me that the central part of India, which covers the states of Gujarat, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, are the pockets which are heavily urbanized, also attract a lot of investment, and therefore, going forward in the next five to 10 years, will be the main markets for consumption. Going north, the states of Rajasthan, Madhya Pradesh, UP, so on and so forth, are the second tier, which have attracted lesser investment, are not as urbanized, but are therefore going to be second tier in the form of market opportunities. And then clearly, the bits on the north and the bits in the far east are lagging behind, uh, where urbanization levels are low and as are mm. investment levels. Yeah. And then the industry sectors that you think are going to play a bigger role? Well, I think going forward, uh, the big investments are really going to be in infrastructure because that's where the government is driving the ball uh, with uh, public-private partnerships. Uh, I think the old-fashioned industries like steel and coal, etc., are a bit over-invested with uh, lagging prices and global commodities. But infrastructure will drive growth. I think the opportunities <coughs> will be in pharmaceuticals, the opportunities will be in consumer goods. But most importantly, the opportunities will be in the new age industries. So, you know, you could hoop out the investments of Amazon and Flipkart, put in billions and billions of dollars, and people think they're going to sink their money, but that's not true. They're looking at longer term opportunities, and in the end, they will come out. Mm. So it's really in uh, the e-commerce and, uh, and the new age industries. You still have in India, which is very diverse, right the way through where the rural economy is still very strong and important, driver of the economy, yet all of these new industries are playing a vital role as well. That is true, but you'd be surprised to hear that now 40% of Indians have internet access. Mm. Do you know that they ship 250 million mobile phones a month and 50% of them are smartphones? Right. So people living in rural communities now by virtue of the expansion of the internet are becoming pretty smart. Mm. So in terms of farmers, they know where to sell their goods, you know, mm. national pricing. So they have a better feel of the marketplace simply by virtue of internet access and technology. Yeah. And as you said, more inclusion in the economy than before, right? so, through that infrastructure. Now you get called upon, of course, by visiting CEOs and, and, and organizations needing to take a deeper look at, at the country. I mean, I was interested to gauge from you how Western companies view India. From the global headquarters, how do you think people view India? I think if I was to answer that question in a single word, it would have to be positive. Mm. Having said that, I think like other people, they had perhaps wrongly higher expectations of you know, what could have happened in the course of the last two or three years. But I think their expectations are now more realistic. Mm. They feel happy about the fact that we have political stability. Yeah. Uh, they feel happy that reforms are happening, albeit at a steady pace. Some disappointment may have happened at the time of demonetization, but that's in the past. Uh, GST has happened. So by and large, I think multinational uh, executives and head offices do see India in positive light. Um, and uh, this is based on the engagements that we've had as a company mm. with them and I've had as an individual having undertaken briefings over the course of the last uh, several months. Mm. So it's great to have a little time to catch up with you and get your perspective. 
you're off this afternoon back to India, and I um, I know you're a very keen supporter of uh, wildlife in India and a, and a keen photographer too. Yes, that is my life. I'm That's your actually, passion. Uh, yes, I'm a conservationist and a wildlife photographer. Thanks very much, and see you again soon. Thank you.